Hi there and welcome to Where's the Money Gone, a podcast about football finance, governance and politics with me, Adrian Goldberg. I'm an investigative journalist and a supporter of championship table topping West Bromwich <laughs> Albion. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta say it while I can, Charlie. And I'm joined. The chuckles you can hear there are from Charlie Methan. He's the chief executive of Charlton Athletic, a former director of Sunderland, a one-time advisor to Arsenal, Spurs, and to his boyhood club, Oxford United. So the baggies, as I've mentioned, Charlie, sitting pretty at the top of the championship after a very good game, actually beating a very well managed by Wayne Rooney. Uh, Plymouth Argyle beat them by a goal to nil. Charlton, first defeat of the season, certainly your first home defeat of the season. It was actually our first home defeat in the league since January. Wow. Um, and uh, it was a very disappointing first 25, 30 minutes. You know when your manager is making substitutes on the 30 minutes and changing the formation that things haven't necessarily all gone according to whatever the plan was. Um, and from that moment on, it was a lot brighter. And it was one of those sort of games where you sort of desperately trying to get there and can't quite get there. One, in, one interesting thing that did happen in the second half that might merit discussion on a future podcast, Adrian, is um, there were no fewer than 11 claimed head injuries, um, none of which actually resulted in a head injury. Um, in other words, the game was stopped for significant periods of times, 11 times during the second half. Of course, there's this new directive that says if there is any potential head injury, the referee has to stop the game. So what effectively happened was every time there was a tackle coming together, whether it be a foul or not a foul, the Blackpool player would crumple to the ground holding his head. Um, the stretcher was brought on five times, I think, um, but never used. Um, and of course, what that does is break up the game massively when you're trying to hang on to a narrow lead and you're struggling and gasping for breath a little bit and the home crowd's getting going. It was a really interesting, but I think potentially very dangerous and potentially very dangerous to the health of players tactic for Steve Bruce to use. Because I think where that leads eventually will be that referees will be placed in a very difficult decision of having to try and work out what is and isn't an authentic head injury. Because you can't carry on in a situation with a game stopping for two or three minutes 11 times in one half. That's just not that's not viable. So I think it's going to be quite an interesting one perhaps to explore with a referee down the track on a pod. Absolutely. And uh, I think we're all familiar, not saying this was the case, between Charlton and Blackpool. You were obviously given a managerial masterclass by the canny old Steve Bruce there. Charlie, I hate to point that out. But yeah. you, you've got... I think there's often been an issue, traditionally, hasn't there, with players going down injured in the closing minutes of a game or in a game perhaps where they're away from home and holding on to a slender lead where there are a suspiciously high number of injuries that fortuitously for the team in the lead disrupt the flow of the play. And as you say, it's in a way much easier to do that now because there's this mandatory interruption quite rightly I think many people would say for a head injury but if there is a suspicion that that's ever being used to support gamesmanship then maybe that whole issue does have to be looked at again absolutely now let's talk about uh, the the footballing aspect of what's been called freebie gate or wardrobe gate. For those who are not familiar with the background to this story, the Prime Minister, the Labour leader, Sakir Starmer, has acknowledged accepting free gifts from Labour donors, not least from Lord Ali, for example, who has bought various items of clothing for Starmer and his wife, a pair of specs or several pairs of spectacles, amongst other things. And it's a row that has come to dominate UK politics at the moment. And suspicion is perhaps that some of it is motivated by people within the Labour government themselves who don't particularly like his chief of staff sue gray but as far as we're concerned in terms of football this is where it gets really important so keir starmer has been given more than thirty-five thousand pounds worth of free tickets to watch his beloved arsenal over the past five years now he said that from now on he's going to start watching games from the director's box to avoid accepting these free gifts but what if those directors, of whom he is a guest at the Emirates, want to bend his ear about the 
powers of the proposed regulator, which might have a direct impact on clubs like uh, Arsenal. It then emerged over the weekend that Starmer and his chief of staff, the aforementioned Sue Gray, had accepted hospitality from Tottenham Hotspur, one of the architects of the proposed breakaway European Super League. So I don't know whether Sakir Starmer and his team can see that, even through his donated spectacles, but it looks bad. It looks as though, if you're an ordinary football supporter, as though the most powerful people in the country might potentially be in a position to be nobbled by those who do not want the regulator to operate, or at least might not want the regulator operate in a way that was originally envisaged. Fair point, Charlie? I think that's a very good summary. <clears throat> and this pod sits in an interesting place. Um, obviously, Adrian, you and I are former investigative journalists, um, and in fact, your case, said are an investigative journalist, and um, have looked at political issues. Then you have on the sports pages sports journalists, including some sports business journalists who look at sports business issues, where the Labour government is currently just maybe getting off a little bit lightly is that no one's yet put this all together. And the intelligence that the sports business journalists has and the knowledge the political journalists have have not yet been brought fully together. Let me explain what I mean. So when the Conservative government proposed the Football Governance Bill, which is the creator of a football regulator, um, it, it started in the House of Parliament, um, it was published first, and then started in the House of Parliament in spring of this year. Um, and broadly speaking, this was met with a giant raspberry from the Premier League, who had been lobbying against it ever seeing the light of day, and met with sort of mild, muted applause from the Football League, who hoped that part of the result of this would be a fairer and more equitable settlement in the financial distribution of TV revenues between the various different divisions. And the critical element of this was whether the new regulator would have the power, if necessary, to impose that financial settlement on the Premier League and the Football League. Now, why is that important? The reason it's important is that historically, the Premier League have simply refused to negotiate in good faith with the Football League. They continually say that they're going to, they might do, then they add all sorts of strings attached, which the Football League couldn't possibly accept, etc., etc., etc. So the only realistic way in which the Football League would gain any leverage in the negotiation over the distribution of what are multi-billion pounds worth of TV revenues, which, let's not forget, until the creation of the Premier League, was split 75%, 25% in favour of the old top division. Now it's about 90%, 10%, right? So... That's the size of what has gone on in the last 30 years. So effectively, the leverage the Football League needed, the Football League bosses, Rick Parry and Trevor Birch, needed in order to have a what might be called a sensible balance discussion and negotiation with the Premier League bosses, was the understanding and knowledge that if they did not come to a reasonable settlement, that the regulator would impose one. And of course, the Premier League would think, well, we, we can't know what that, that could be quite bad. That could be much worse than anything that we might offer the Football League ourselves. So perhaps it behoves us. Perhaps it might be the sensible thing to do for us to offer the Football League something reasonable in advance of that imposition. Now, what this was talking about was the distribution of TV revenues. And it became clear that this power was going to be included. And the question then became, what defines TV revenues. And particularly, do the parachute payments, which the Premier League until now has claimed are a distribution of TV revenues, do the parachute payments, a huge chunk of the total amount that gets handed in theory to football league clubs, do they get included in the power of the regulator? In other words, does the regulator potentially have the power to end parachute payments? Now, this is massively seismically important, not only for the clubs of the Football League who might receive that money in a more equitable type of way rather than it all going to four clubs, but on top of that, it would have a material impact on the valuations of clubs in the bottom half of the Premier League and in the Championship. Huge, huge difference. 
one of the things that keeps valuations of clubs in the championship lower than it would otherwise be at the moment is that the knowledge that those clubs are going to have to compete against parachute payment clubs coming down from the Premier League with a massive inbuilt anti-competitive advantage. One of the things that keeps the bottom half of the Premier League club's valuations extremely high is the knowledge that even if they get relegated, they will still for three years receive these enormous TV payments which will enable them to bounce back much more quickly and outcompete their rivals. So let's just talk about what that me might mean for West Brom. who might be said to be in the epicentre of this storm, being the highest placed non-parachute club in the country. So if there were no parachute payments, and if it wasn't the case that in January, for instance, Leeds and Sheffield United could splash 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 million pounds, right now West Brom would be favourites to go up. So why aren't West Brom favourites to go up? It's because the betting market knows that the parachute payment clubs are going to be able to splash a lot more money in January than West Brom will ever be able to splash. And that will enable them potentially to overcome a disparity in the current quality. So what that means in terms of valuation? Well, currently West Brom might be worth 100 million. If it wasn't for parachute payments, it might be worth 170 to 180 million pounds. And again, just for people who haven't heard our previous podcast, just to explain why the Premier League loves parachute payments and wants to lock them in. They believe that it enhances the value of the Premier League because it means that if a club goes up, perhaps a club like Luton Town, who are not minted and don't have wealthy owners and who might be tempted to just bank the income they receive from the Premier League. They did do, which, which they did do. Which, Indeed, which talent, but but which the, but, the, but the idea of the but they still invested in players of a of a decent quality like Ross Barkley, uh, like Andros Townsend. But the idea of the parachute payment is to say to those clubs, look, you can spend the money; you don't have to put it in the bank. Buy big name players, buy players on decent contracts, because you will be confident that you've got this insurance policy that is the parachute payment and it means that if you've committed to long-term contracts when you go down you will still be able to pay for them research conducted by sheffield hallam university a couple of years ago showed that on average a club in the championship gets on with parachute payments gets on average 16 points more a season than clubs who don't. So the the Premier League likes it because it underpins the value and the prestige of the Premier League, keeps, in their view, the, the quality of the Premier League at a reasonable level. The championship clubs hate it because it distorts the championship as a, as a competition. Yeah, well, look, I don't want to get into a long debate about the merits or otherwise of parachute payments because this is fundamentally a political story, not about um, the sort of ins and outs of the football industry. My answer has long been to that, that a one-off adjustment mechanism is sufficient to sort out the problem that you're talking about. And the parachute payments have become miles bigger than they ever needed to be in order to en enable Premier League clubs, newly minted Premier League clubs, to spend a little bit more in their first year, which is a perfectly reasonable point to make. But do you really need to be rewarded to the tune of an extra £120 million over the following three years in order to sign a few extra players in your first year, I mean, not really. That's that's totally out of all proportion, out of all kilter. And it was never intended to be at those levels. It's just what's happened to Premier League TV revenues have made it that way. But anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is, these are effectively the, the, the decision as to whether in, to include parachute payments in the power of the regulator is a decision, is a multi-billion pound decision. Multi, multi billion pound decision. I've calculated it being around about four to five billion pounds over the next four years in terms of the total impact of this particular decision. Now, let's go back to when the bill was before Parliament under the Conservative government. The Conservative government proposed it, and the Labour front bench, which at that point on DCMS matters was led by Thangham Debonair, the shadow DCMS the then shadow DCMS secretary, supported by Stephanie Peacock, the shadow sports secretary. And Peacock in particular, but Devon as well, had spent a long time really getting their heads around this. And I know everyone in football who spoke to these two 
were very impressed with how seriously they took the detail on this. They took briefings from everybody. They did the work themselves. They read the Krauts report. They tore it to pieces. They spoke to backbenchers. They spoke to football clubs. They spoke to other regulators. They spoke to everybody. And they came out with the conclusion that for the regulator to actually work and for it to be meaningful, parachute payments had to be included. So Labour then moved an amendment to the bill in committee and then to be placed in, on the floor of the House that parachute payments should be ruled inside the scope of the regulator. Now, at this point, our blessed then Prime Minister, the hapless Rishi Sunak, decided to call his genius early election. And he called it two weeks before the football governance bill effectively would have become law. Now, let's be clear. Because the Tories had quite a big majority still at that point, probably Labour's amendment probably would not have passed, right? So probably the regulator would have been created without the parachute payments included within the scope of his or her responsibilities or capabilities effectively. But of course, that's not what happened. What happened was, is effectively the bill got called off. Labour included in their manifesto the establishment of a football regulator. And civil servants at the departure of culture, media and sport simply assumed effectively that the old bill would be brought forward, but with the Labour amendments. Stephanie Peacock, Peacock was still minister, minister for sport, was to become Minister for Sport. Unfortunately, Thangham Debonair lost her seat in Bristol to the Greens, but was replaced by Lisa Nandy, who also is extremely expert in football finance because of her status as the MP for Wigan. And she's been heavily involved in saving Wigan a couple of times and is very cognizant of all the various issues faced by lower league clubs, etc. So I think the civil servants it assumed and effectively were writing up the bill to include the provisions as, as suggested by Labour just a couple of months beforehand. Um, now, uh, and that would also be the case for the Football League as well. The Football League also kind of, you know, in a like, sort of gentle sort of way, assume, well, Labour, we're going to try and push this through Parliament. They would presumably push this through Parliament. Now, why wouldn't they? Generally speaking, Labour is on the side of the underdog against the oligopolies, generally speaking, in, in business life and industrial life, et cetera, et cetera. Why would they suddenly do something which was so massively in favour of the oligopolies, the Premier League, as changing their mind on such a crucial matter the moment they got into power. So it was about sort of three weeks ago that I started to hear in the political undergrowth of rumours that number 10 had started to get involved in this dispute, well, not dispute really, but this sort of framing of this bill, because the bill's meant to be going through Parliament in a few weeks' time, and that people in the DCMS were under pressure to water it down, effectively to make it more favourable to the Premier League clubs. I mean, so look, this can't be right. Why would this be the case? Who, who, would, who in the Labour government would have the interest to actually interfere? They've got the economy to worry about. They've got major industrial strategy, they've got immigration concerns, foreign policy issues to do with Israel, all this type of stuff. Why would Downing Street be getting involved in something that effectively was a settled matter? Labour had already made its mind up on this some time ago, and it was just a matter of programmatically just pushing it through Parliament. And I guess, optically now, we know the reason. Optically, now we can see what has what was happening is that there was some very concerted lobbying going on by Premier League clubs and Premier League bosses of the most senior people in government, persuading them of their case, as laid out by you a few moments ago, uh, Adrian, which is, look, the Premier League is the all-important thing. Forget the lower league clubs. They're irrelevant. doesn't matter. Destroy them all. It really doesn't matter. Come on, Keir. Get with the programme. You like coming to the Arsenal. Come on. It's the Emirates. It's fun. It's great. You know, Arsenal competing for the Champions League. Come on. Forget about miserable clubs like Barnet, whatever. Like that. Forget about it. It doesn't matter. And a, there was then a gradual movement in the undergrowth of Whitehall to say the powers that be would not want parachute payments included in this bill. That, as I said, was happening in the undergrowth, and then suddenly all this publicity explodes, saying that all this hospitality has been paid for and accepted by protagonists in this dispute. And of course, those in the football industry are not unnaturally crying foul. And of course, if for some reason, Charlie, I've no reason to doubt you, but if you've got it wrong, of course, the proof 
of the pudding will be in the eating, won't it? Whether or not, when the bill is brought forward, it's being introduced by the House of Lords, whether the bill does include parachute payments within the scope of the regulator. I think it's also worth noting that in the Mail on Sunday at the weekend, when Keir Starmer and Sue Gray were at Spurs Stadium as guests of Spurs watching Arsenal against Spurs away, Miss Gray, Sue Gray, was pictured next to a lady called Katie Perriol, who was the founder and chair of a communications company which worked on the attempt to secure the Super League breakaway. So again, we're not suggesting, let's be clear about this, Charlie, we're not suggesting that anything untoward or improper has happened, but this is about access to power. That's what money can potentially buy you, access to power, access to the opportunity to bend somebody's ear and to promote the arguments. Now, in itself, somebody hearing an argument, there's nothing wrong with that. There are two sides to every story. But if you believe that the regulator should have the job of bringing the Premier League to an extent to heal of ensuring a fairer distribution of finance across the football ecosphere, for want of a better word, then you want to make sure that those decisions are being taken even-handedly and that there has been no pressure brought to bear. And it is very difficult, at least when you have the impression that the most powerful people in the country are being very chummy with those whose interests lie in the opposite direction. Yeah, let's, let's be quite clear. Um, lobbying is a legitimate exercise. Um, and I have been a lobbyist myself um, in various sporting industries. And it is perfectly legitimate to say, I want to speak to the, the powers that be to explain why they should look at the situation from my perspective. And that goes on and always has goes on, always has gone on. Really, the question comes when, let's say, the person who's meant to be doing the listening has a personal or even group corporate reason for listening more to one side of the argument to the other. I want to take you back my first years as a journalist, which was in the early years of the Blair government. I joined the Daily Telegraph in 1997, 98, just as Blair had come to power. I don't know if you remember, you probably do, Adrian, being of, um, you know, perhaps an even, even greater vintage than, than me, um, that one of the first scandals that engulfed the Blair government, really, in fact, I think the very first scandal, really, was what, was what became known as the Eccleston Affair. Effectively, what happened is that Bernie Eccleston made a £1 million donation to the Labour Party, not to Blair personally, the Labour Party. And subsequently, um, the Labour government, um, with some input, I think, from number 10, made the decision that the motor racing industry, which at the time Bernie Eccleston effectively ran, Formula One, um, would be exempt from the ban on tobacco advertising that they were placing on other sports. So all the other sports, darts, snooker, et cetera, that have been heavily dependent on tobacco advertising, the Benson and Hedges Invitational, the John Player Sunday League, and all this type of stuff. That would all go, but McLaren could still be sponsored by Morgan. And these these were big, again, big numbers. And the fact that Eccleston had donated this million pounds was seen to be more than lobbying. It was seen to be an attempt to buy that decision. That's how it was perceived. I don't know if you remember, it was early in Blair's honeymoon, something which poor old free gear Starmer is not enjoying it was uh, it was in Blair's honeymoon and he came up with the immortal line when explaining this whole thing I think people know I'm a pretty straight kind of guy um and uh, and thus the whole thing was sort of hung around like a bad smell but in reality the government was so popular at the time that it could sort of ride through that storm and really the question is if the Labour government this time having with with Starmer personally and the chief of staff personally having accepted such large numbers of amounts of hospitality if at the end of that, they effectively change their policy to the tune of the people who have been giving that hospitality, I think that then goes a little bit beyond lobbying. Um, and, and you don't need to give somebody a free box in order to explain your point of view. In the football league, 
go into CE policymakers in Whitehall and in um, you know Downing Street, etc., to explain their position. But of course, they don't own Arsenal. They can't give that person a box at Arsenal. So are they then at a disadvantage because they're not in a position to hand out the goodies that that particular decision maker might want? That's the problem. It's not the lobbying. It's the inclusion of financial gain alongside the lobbying. Indeed. And as much as anything, it's about perception, isn't it? As football supporters, whatever we think about a regulator and what its power should be, we want that judgment to be made out with any financial considerations. And if people think it's unfair to taint Keir Starmer or to ask questions about this, well, it, it's no different than you would ask of any other politician who has a financial arrangement of some kind or a financial benefit or gain of some kind from an organisation that they are then seeking to regulate. It just doesn't look right. It doesn't smell right. I'll take you back also, Charlie. I'm, as you know, perennially writing this book, Where's the Money Gone? Uh, One Fans Football Finance Odyssey. And I've been rece researching the Football Task Force, which you may remember was chaired by David Meller. And that actually did a lot of good work and went around the country, very much as Tracy Crouch did, taking advice and guidance from clubs, from supporters, from various fan groups. And... At the final hurdle, which is to introduce effectively a football regulator, it wasn't called a football regulator, but it would have had many of the powers that are now envisaged by the football regulator. All of the supporters groups involved backed it. All of the independents backed it, uh, including a former chief of the Metropolitan Police, Sir Herman Oosley from Kick It Out. Everybody supported the idea of this independent regulator, except the FA, the Premier League, and the Football League, who, of course, had a vested interest in not being regulated. But this was a government-commissioned report. Somehow, between that final report being put forward, or the two final reports, there was a majority report, and then the minority put report from the football industry itself, which opposed the idea of a regulator, somewhere in that process... After all this research and after all this fact-finding and consultation, the Blair government decided it would not impose a regulator. And here we are talking a quarter of a century on about another Labour government potentially, potentially being nobbled to reduce the powers of the regulator. It's not good. Well, I, think, I, think, I think, look, I mean, Adrian... Look, the reality is, is that the Premier League is an immensely strong and powerful and efficient organisation. And it fights its battles where it can fight them, and it fights them very hard and very well. Um, the, the battle they were fighting in the Conservative Party required no hospitality. Um, indeed, most Tory MPs don't really like them. I mean, honest to you, I haven't met many of them. I know Rishi Sunak pretends to be a Southampton fan, but in reality, he's a cricket fan. Um, so effectively, but what they did have on their side of the Conservative government and the way in which they managed to get parachute payments ruled out, don't forget the Crouch report ruled them in. So the actual official government report said parachute payments absolutely should be considered as part of the TV industry. So really what this was is playing on the Conservative Party's natural suspicion of regulation. They went on a real rampage through the, the Tory top ranks of the Tory party, most of whom don't even like football, saying... What are you even doing regulating football? What, you know, really? Is that what a conservative government should do? And that was pretty effective. You know, that it was only that the whole thing was far enough down the track and that it had been in the manifesto under Boris. If it hadn't been for that, it wouldn't have happened. But they sort of said, well, we're going to have to do it. We'll make it as weak as we possibly can, but we'll have to do it. Right. And at that point, various people in the Labour Party were saying to, the Football League and to various other, you know, the, the FSA and various other people. Look, no, just let the Conservatives get it on the statute book. Just let it, let them make it law. We can always tighten it up later on. Once Labour comes to power, we can make it stronger. You know, that's perfectly achievable, et cetera, et cetera. Let's just get it on the statute book and use this opportunity. But because of what Sunak did in calling the election when he did, it wasn't on the statute book. Now, effectively, what that did is sort of let the Premier League switched its lobbying broker. We said, OK, well, we've got a problem here, a big, big problem, which is this is a, a government coming in, a 
effectively with a commitment to include the parachute payments. And we're not going to be able to prey on their reluctance to regulate because the Labour Party loves regulating everything, right? So we're not going to be able to say to them that regulating in itself is a bad idea. Where we're going to have to get to here is we're going to have to really find whatever pressure points we can find in the upper ranks of the party and try and persuade them, you know, phrases like don't kill the golden goose, you know, it's a precious part of Great Britain PLC, you know, just be very careful. You don't know the unintended consequences. Now, of course, the thing is the people in number 10 have not done the work. They haven't read the culture report. They haven't gone around speaking to the Football League and the FSA and all these types of people. They just meet the head of the CBI, the head of Unilever, the head of the Premier League, and they, they think that is business, right, broadly speaking. So when the head of the Premier League walks in and goes, well, you know, it was great to see you last week. You know, fantastic to see you at the Arsenal last week. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you had a terrific time. Of course, that's the type of entertainment we do. That's the type of organisation we are. We are part of Great Britain PLC. And this, this, this rather irksome bill which the Tories put together, I mean, no, it's not really your kind of thing, is it? I mean, really? I mean, you know, you're all for growth. You're all about exports. You're all about this, that and the other. And you can eat, it's, it's hardly top of the in is it? When you're dealing with the war in Gaza, you're dealing with, you know, change in US president, you're dealing with economic issues and all sorts of things. How difficult is it just to say, yeah, do you know what? You're probably right. This, these parachute payments, very complex issue. I'll tell you what, look, just go run down to DCMS and tell them to get, get rid of that. No one's going no to get So I don't, I don't think it's intentional. I don't think it's some sort of horribly venal conspiracy. I think it's more carelessness. And one side having the access to the ear, which enables that carelessness to be dispensed down through the whitehall system in a rather grand patriarchal sort of way, which will be something along the lines of boss ain't, boss ain't keen on this. The boss ain't keen on this. And that's probably about as far as it's gone. And finally, and briefly, Charlie, then, it is your very clear understanding that that pressure has been brought to bear and that Downing Street is not in favour of including parachute payments within the regulator's realm of powers. That's what we've been hearing. Football League clubs have been hearing this for some weeks now. Um, and we, we hear that generally because obviously we speak to our own MPs. We speak to other people who are in the policy framework of that. And of course, this bill is being drawn up, right? This is not a, a sort of fictional sort of thing. This is kind of happening, right? There is a document somewhere, as you say, which is shortly going to be placed before the House of Lords, which in itself is an interesting interesting device that might tell its own story about what's really going on here, because of course the Lords are going to face an awful lot of detailed opposition, whereas in the Commons it might. Charlie, great to speak to you as always. Thank you. We'll see how this one develops. Uh, great as always to chat with Charlie. Before we go, just a reminder that that book I refer to, you can keep up to date with uh, chapters and drafts over at my Substack, adriangoldberg.substack.com. Thanks to Jed Thomas for his production assistance with this episode and to Mark Machado at 1129 for working on the socials. I'm Adrian Goldberg. He is Charlie Methven. We'll be back again next week. But for for now. Thanks for listening. Cheers. Bye-bye.